All right. So thank you so much, Hugh, for uh, setting the stage here. I did want to, uh, I, I'm Sherrod Griffin, and I work at Red Hat and focusing on uh, AI and our AI initiatives. I'm in the AI Center of Excellence in the office of the CTO. Uh, my primary responsibilities are a project called Open Data Hub, which is our reference implementation of doing machine learning on top of uh, Kubernetes for scalability and for the hybrid cloud. And uh, I have with us today, Kate Senko, and uh, I'm super excited to have her. She's doing some really exciting work uh, in her area, and she is an associate professor and director of computer vision and learning group at Boston University. And she, I'm going to let her, Kate, if you want to give a little bit of an introduction and a background of, of who you are and what you've done, that'd be great. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Shard, for the introduction. And um, I'm also very happy to be here and um, happy to be invited to share some of our research. Um, I'm uh, Kate Sayanka. I'm a, a faculty member in the computer science department at VU. And um, I've been working on AI and computer vision and natural language processing for. Um, a long time, let's just say. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, my primary research is in deep learning with applications to computer vision and uh, natural language, as, as I mentioned. Um, I have a, a, a research group of wonderful, very smart uh, PhD students and postdocs at BU. Um, and I'm also affiliated with the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think I have some slides that I was going to share if you want me to go into that. Yeah, um, about... I was going to say, um, you're doing all the cool stuff. You've got a combination of, of research work in, in the universities, you're doing uh, things with IBM and, and, and Watson and the, that team. Um, so it's really, really cool to see. And to kind of set the background before uh, Kate dives into her slides, uh, you know, what we wanted to talk about today is a little bit about her experience with deep, learn deep learning and the computer vision and some of the problems that she's faced with that. Uh, looking at it specifically from uh, data set bias, you know, how do we, how does that impact uh, the machine learning algorithms when your data itself has intrinsic bias? But then also, uh, anyone that's tried to do some level of AI and machine learning, it's it's a beast, and the beast has to be fueled by data, and you got to you know cram as much data into it as possible uh, until it becomes accurate and, and you're happy with the results. Uh, and Kate will tell talk about some of the techniques that she's researching and looking into to make it to where you don't have to have such massive amounts of of, of data. Um, so with that said, Kate, do you want to go ahead and, and share through share your slides and kind of set the stage for some of the, the conversation we'll have later on? Okay, so uh, what I want to talk about just just to highlight and I, you know, I, this isn't going to be a super technical presentation. Um, but just to highlight some of the things that we've been working on uh, to uh, sort of address this problem of biased data sets, uh, both biased and small data sets. So as Shard mentioned, AI and machine learning these days are very data hungry. So if you wanted to um, apply AI to some problem, you probably need lots of labeled data to train it with. But you don't always have that training data. You don't always have a lot of it. So what I work on is basically how can we learn from less data? How can we uh, learn from small data sets and also from maybe data sets that are large but biased in some way? And um, you know, it and bias in data sets actually a very common problem. In fact, I would challenge you to give me a data set that isn't biased. Um, I, I believe that every single data set, just by definition of sampling a limited amount of data, will be biased in some way. So first of all, what I mean by data set biased is when you collect a data set for training an AI model, here the example is training a convolutional neural network to detect pedestrians in car, um, 
driving data and in, in, in camera recordings uh, recorded from a car for let's say self-driving or, or driver assist. Um, so we want this model to detect pedestrians and images and to do that, we need to collect a lot of examples of pedestrians and images um, and label them by drawing these bounding boxes that you see here. And so we can train this neural network on this kind of data, but suppose that now at test time, we deploy the car in New England and it sees data like this. And notice that the training data it was, it was trained with came from California mostly, or California or maybe uh, Arizona and places like that. Um, so it never actually saw any snow or um, even much rain or people wearing heavy coats in its training data. So what's going to happen is that this neural network is going to fail. It's going to miss pedestrians. Um, it's not going to detect all of them. It's going to um, have a, a much higher error than it, it did on the training domain. So we call this a training domain and a target domain or source domain and target domain. So this is the problem I'm talking about. It's called data set bias. Um, it's also known as domain shift. Um, it's a shift because you have data that looks different at training and at deployment time. So this is something that I've been looking at for a long time. Um, the, the, the earliest paper I published on this was in 2010. Um, so it's, it's been a longstanding interest of mine to, to solve this problem. And just to give you another, a couple more examples of when this data set bias happened. As, as I mentioned earlier, I think it happens in pretty much every data set that you'll ever use if you use machine learning um, for, for a real world problem, of course. And the academic data sets, it's not an issue. But if you're applying something in the real world, it's always going to be a problem. Um, so as I already showed you before, this could be a change from one city to another. Or it could be a change from data collected on the web, like these product images from amazon.com. Um, and then at test time, we're given images collected from a robot. So these are visual domains. Um, and I, I work on computer vision a lot. So you'll, most of the examples today are from computer vision. Another example is when we train um, AI in simulation, like in robotics, for example, we often want to train in simulation because it doesn't damage the robot. It, it's cheaper to get the data. But then we want to apply the model in actual real world environments. So that's another data set bias. A data set bias also happens uh, when we have uh, different demographics that are underrepresented in the training data. So you might have heard about this bias in facial recognition algorithms. Um, this happens often because the training data that facial recognition is trained with is biased towards certain demographics. For example, mostly male, mostly light skinned. Um, and then when it's deployed in the real world and applied to different demographics, maybe uh, darker skin and more females, it will have higher errors on those populations. Um, also, this can happen when our data is biased to a particular culture, like here, if you're training uh, a model to recognize weddings, they might look different in, for example, North America versus India. So uh, I do have one example of textual data, uh, which also has data set bias issues, of course. Uh, so here, for example, if you wanted to train your model on data that comes from social media, like Twitter, for example, um, and then you want to apply that model to uh, data that comes from the news domain, maybe New York Times or Fox News or um, some kind of uh, news domain, which is going to have different style, different uh, language, different vocabulary, even you know, spelling and all of that. So there's going to be a, a large difference in the domains between these training and test data sets. So, all right, so why is this even a problem? Um, I'll give you one example of how much domain bias reduces accuracy. 
So here we're just going to take the MNIST data set. This is you know, machine learning 101. You always start with MNIST. Uh, so there's 10 digits that we're trying to classify. And we, if we train a neural network on MNIST and then test it on MNIST, then we have very high accuracy, 99% or higher. But what happens if we train it also on the same 10 digits, but in this case, the training domain is from street view house numbers. So uh, there is this domain shift between them. We see that when you test this model on MNIST, the performance drops to 67%, which is really bad for this task. And in fact, if we change our source domain to be this USPS data set, which actually looks visually a lot sim more similar to MNIST, but we have a similar drop in performance regardless because of the domain shift between these two. And also, by the way, if we swap and we train an MNIST and test an USPS, we have similarly bad performance. Um, so this is an example of how much this can actually affect even the most modern powerful neural networks that we now use in AI. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if we trained um, object uh, classification, like product classification model on uh, web-based images that have these white backgrounds and canonical poses, and we apply it to uh, more of a robotics domain, at test time, we also have a significant drop in accuracy. And where this could be useful is, for example, in warehousing. This is an example of a warehouse uh, in Amazon where we might want a robot using cameras to identify different products and put them in packages and sort them in different bins. So, so this is a real life problem that we'd like to solve where the training data could probably would mostly come from, from the web domain or from, from like an Amazon product catalog. All right, so um, I'm not sure how much more time I, I want to spend um, kind of explaining how we address this problem, but I'll just try to spend about five minutes on that. Um, and then I'm happy to go into more details if people are interested. So basically our problem is data set bias or we have a source domain with lots of labeled data and a target domain with unlabeled data. And we want to learn a classifier F that achieves a low expected loss under the target distribution. So what causes this poor performance? Basically, there are two main reasons, I would say. One is that the training and test data distributions are different. So here, the blue points are one digit domain that the model was trained on. And then the red, red points are uh, a different digit domain that the model wasn't trained on. So it's at our unlabeled target domain that we want to apply the model to. And you can see that the distributions, even visually, are very different. So this will cause, definitely cause a drop in performance. Another reason is that the model trained on the blue points lacks discriminative features for the red target points. You can see that they're not as well clustered in different categories as the blue points are. And so one of the main techniques that we've been using is adversarial domain alignment. So here we have our encoder network convolutional neural network, which is extracting some features. It's learning how to extract those features, feeding them into a classifier. So this is the standard supervised training paradigm. And now we have a classifier that we're learning here. When we have our unlabeled target data that comes from a different distribution, we could just directly use the encoder CNN to um, extract those features and feed them through the classifier. But as I already mentioned, their distribution will be different, so the classifier will not be as accurate on those points. So in adversarial domain alignment, our goal is to align these distributions, the blue source distribution with the uh, orange target distribution. But we don't want to have to collect labels, so we have to do this in an unsupervised way. And so the way this is achieved is we're going to introduce another classifier, which we call the domain discriminator. and this network will take points, uh, will take these blue and orange feature points, and we'll try to assign a label to them, uh, which tells, which says which domain they came from. So it's going to try to label them into either the source or the target domain. 
And, and so we train this with an adversarial loss where we first train the discriminator to become good at distinguishing the two distributions. And then we train the encoders to fool the discriminator, to basically maximize the discriminator's error. And what this does is it makes the encoder produce features that are invariant to the domain difference. So aligns the two distributions. So that's adversarial alignment. And here we can see um, uh, sort of a, the before and after we apply this technique. So the before is what I showed you earlier. And then after on the right is after uh, adaptation with this adversarial alignment technique. So you can see that the two distributions now have become very well aligned, in fact, almost identical. Um, and the performance also improves. Another approach we can apply here is pixel space or, or translation at the data level. So we can actually take the source data, these images, and use a GAN, a generative adversarial network, to make them look like they came from our target domain. So maybe you've heard of GANs or you've seen GANs being applied to generate images or do things like deep fakes. So we can actually do the same thing here and uh, make our source data basically look like the target data. Um, and then this will mitigate this problem of domain shift. And we can still do feature alignment as I described earlier on top of this that also tends to help. Um, so I, that's basically it. Like the one last thing I wanna show is an application of this to robotics. So here our approach, um, we're applying domain alignment on the depth images that a camera is observing while it's learning to guide this peg into the hole while avoiding all the objects around it. And so what we're doing here is we're applying pixel level alignment to the camera view. So we're making um, uh, the real depth view, this is actually backwards, the real depth view look like the simulated uh, view that the model had seen in training. Um, so I'll just quick replay the video. Uh, so this is a demonstration of the approach actually working in, in the real world after we train it in simulation. So at training time, it only saw simulated depth images, and then we adapted them to look, uh, so we adapted the test data actually to look like it came from um, the simulated domain. So, okay, that's it for me. Very cool. Slides, at least. <laughs> That's that's a lot more interesting than the research I do. <laughs> um, so, Kate, you mentioned a lot about GAN and adversarial domains. Uh, of course, as more and more AI hits the practical applications, uh, there's there's a lot of effort going towards uh, detecting adversarial AI and and you know hackers using AI and and whatnot. How is the how are the techniques you're using for being able to detect bias? Is there any correlation to adversarial AI and, and being able to uh, understand maybe different areas? You know, new data comes in that the system hasn't seen before and being able to react to that appropriately. Like you always hear the example of um, there's a stop sign and if you slap a sticker on the stop sign, then the, uh, the uh, self-driving car doesn't detect it as a stop sign, but it needs to be able to, to have that kind of awareness. Is there, are there any correlations to the work you're doing? Um, yeah, I think there, there are um, correlations because you can think of adversarial uh, techniques as sort of basically uh, inserting some small amount of noise into the image um, to throw off the classifier to make it predict a different label. Like you said, if you apply some noise to a stop sign, a picture of a stop sign, it will uh, cause the model to classify it as, uh, you know, a car or something else, some other category. Um, and that basically what that does is it changes the input um, in a way that, you know, the model hadn't seen in training. Um, and so uh, one of the techniques that people use is actually, you know, training on such adversarial examples as well. Mm -hmm. So that way the model will have seen them in training. Um, but, um, 
you could you could probably also use these uh, domain alignment techniques um, as well. Um, and people have also used adversarial examples actually in, in the other direction to improve domain um, adaptation performance. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of like generating synthetic examples using adversarial techniques um, for training so that the model becomes more robust. So a lot of it is just about training the model in a way that makes it more robust. I see. I see. And we do have a question in the chat here as well from Diane. Uh, she asks, which is, what is the best technique uh, to correct for domain shift when going from single digit train model to a multi digit test domain? Um, I'm not sure what Diane means by single digit versus multi digit. Um, I guess if I had to guess, um, I would say like, if you just have a, a single digit that mm -hmm. you're trying to detect versus a sequence of digits, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, right. So I think you could use a lot of the same techniques, um, because what, what I was talking about, these uh, adversarial alignment techniques, they're agnostic to what caused the domain shift. There's actually nothing in these models that requires you to specify what caused it. Like, is it, was it because the lighting changed? Was it because you have more clutter now or something else? Mm -hmm. um, the idea is to automatically learn how to recover from this difference in the distributions. And from the research you've done, uh, where you've implemented these techniques, what type of improvements have you uh, been able to see in terms of the accuracy of the models? Um, yeah, so sometimes it's a pretty dramatic improvement. Um, so for example, when we um, transfer the model from simulation to real data, we see, you know, 10% accuracy improvement, 20% accuracy improvement. Uh, and that's without collecting any label data on our target task. Um, so it really depends on kind of how, how large the domain shift is and also um, how much uh, data we have to train with in the source and in the target. Okay. Okay. Um, and you know, some of the things when, when you look at what you traditionally need to do for uh, being able to train your models, if you're coming from an Amazon or a Google, then you're great, right? There's massive amounts of data, massive amounts of information. The world is your oyster. Uh, but for a lot of companies, that's, that's simply not the case. And, and I see you mentioned like MNIST and some of the other open source data sets that are out there. Do you, say, do you see any ability to further enhance being able to detect bias or being able to uh, work with uh, improving accuracy if there's an ability for more data to be available for everyone? Um, well, again, I think that the problem of data set bias will exist no matter how much data we have. Mm -hmm. um, unless we can sample the entire world. And, and um, you know, even for Google, I would say, you know, if you have um, lots and lots of data, first of all, if you wanted to train a model on more data, you would need to make the model bigger. Mm -hmm. And that means that, you know, it's harder to deploy it on small devices uh, or even on regular devices. It, it requires a lot more power, a lot more memory. Um, and so if you wanted, you wanted a model that could um, deploy and adapt to different domains on the fly instead of you know, training it on a huge amount of data that covers all possible domains that you could see, um, that's one thing you could do. But I would say that even if you had a very large amount of data, I mean, you know, MNIST, I don't consider an AI problem because it's, you know, it's not an interesting problem anymore. It's been solved. Um, but there's just a million of other visual problems we could be solving, like, you know, identifying every possible species of bird or every possible species of, um, I don't know, certain insects or mm -hmm. um, detecting disease, you know, classifying uh, cancer in um, mammograms or in CT scans. And there will always be cases, that, you know, like that where no matter how much data you collect, 
it will be biased in some ways. So um, do you do you have um, so with the research you've been doing, you mentioned you know, you've been doing computer vision for quite some time, and you've been looking at um, deep learning and, and data bias and 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 how we can make smaller data sets more effective. What are some of the practical uh, applications that that you see your research being able to help out with both in academics and in corporations? Uh, I think any application where you're using deep learning to solve a problem, particularly when you have images or video um, and you want to apply your model to the real world. So mm -hmm. if you only want to show good performance on kind of a, a data set that you collect in the lab and it stays in the lab and you, you just, you know, you just want to show that you can solve that problem on that one fixed data set, probably you don't need this. But if you actually want to solve a real world problem and, you know, make it into a product or make it, you know, work um, on real data with real people or real, you know, whatever problem setting you have, you're going to need to take care of this because you're inevitably going to encounter out of sample data. You know, again, because you can't collect all the data in the world for training. It's just not possible. I see. I see. And I think one of the reasons I get excited, I, I am excited about your work, uh, specifically in the line of work that I do, is because we focus, we're focusing a lot this year on um, uh, infrastructure for the edge. And, and when you think of uh, edge computing, uh, you'll have, you know, if you if you look at it from like a factory data, you know, factory, um, uh, maybe an assembly line or something like that, where you have many different factories all over the world and the footprint of those data centers have to be really small, right? You can't, and even the models that you push to the edge have to be really small, but they have to do interesting things like detect if there's, uh, you know, using image, you know, image classification or, or some kind of computer vision, detecting if, if something looks incorrect with the, with the, the, uh, um, uh, the tools that are being used or the machinery that's being used or, or something interesting and having that domain space of we can't push very large models to the edge because it's just too big. Um, but how do we get more accurate results? I think that's a really good application, at least on the Red Hat side for uh, how we can bridge the research you're doing with with an applicable, uh, you know, application uh, that we're actually looking at presenting to our customers. Yeah, no, I think that that's a very good um, application, you know, like, you know, inspection of in, in industrial settings, you know, that's where computer vision can definitely be of a lot of value, uh, especially in remote settings where um, maybe it's difficult for people to actually get there and do inspections, you know, and people are also now putting these models on drones. Um, which again is even a smaller platform. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know the edge. I assume you're talking still about some kind of server, but um, you know, a drone is something that's it has to be really lightweight. Yeah, you're correct. And, and I actually, that's a very good point. I was mentioning the edge from a, a data center perspective, but you're right. There's even a, a, a far, you know, edge that's farther out that's on the devices, right? Small devices. Um, you know, it could be a refrigerator, could be a drone, could be, um, you know, just some, some interesting machinery. Uh, so that's a very good, that's a very interesting point as well. Now, what are some of the challenges you faced? You, you mentioned you've been working in this area for quite some time. Um, do you feel like data bias is starting to get more mainstream in terms of techniques to combat it? Are there still challenges that you're facing before you, you see some of your research becoming more mainstream. Uh, talk to us a little bit more about that. Sure. Yeah. So I know that we're um, almost um, at the end of our session here. So just very briefly, one of the challenges that we faced when we started this work was just even, even getting the academic community to accept that this is a real problem that we should be addressing because the academic community uh, has always been very happy to sort of take an academic data set or some kind of in the lab data set and you know, split it into training and testing portions and just work with that and keep showing performance on that. Um, and even just kind of convincing people that what happens that now if you train this model and you deploy it on something completely different, um, that it will not work as well. You know, it was just disbelief and like, no, you just, you aren't doing mm -hmm. it right. 
Um, but nowadays, I think it's become a lot more mainstream. And one of the places where I think even um, uh, people like generally in society are becoming aware of this problem is racial data bias in, in face recognition algorithms or gender recognition algorithms. Um, so I think that's that's been popularized a lot more in the media. Um, and so it's something that people are kind of starting to recognize that it's a problem with, with AI methods. Great, great. And I imagine as we get more self-driving cars on the road, <laughs> that will also surface a lot of these problems. <laughs> I'm not getting into one of those a long time. <laughs> That's that's not good for a researcher in computer vision to say that. Oh man, that makes me rethink all of the Tesla vehicles on the road now. <laughs> keep your keep your hands on the wheel. Yeah, yeah, Hugh, I think you're gonna have to cancel your 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 um, pre-order for the Tesla truck. <laughs> yes, for the Tesla truck. David Cox, uh, who who leads IBM AI research at MIT, um, it loves to say that you would not believe how often someone walks across the street in the United States wearing a Tyrannosaurus Rex costume. <laughs> <laughs> That's and funny. So computer vision, until we figure out how to solve for Tyrannosaurus Rex crossing the street, is not going to work in self-driving cars. <laughs> I really enjoyed that talk, uh, Katie. So uh, thank you very okay. much for it. Um, and I second, I, I work very closely with Gerard, uh, more on the marketing side of things, obviously. So I'm always on the lookout for, for interesting <laughs> new stories to tell. Great. Um, so Can I'm, I'm really here to listen to what other people are, are asking. Um, but I, um, of course, we're all concerned with, uh, biases some of the specific ones that you touched upon you know that yep. affect our inclusion and diversity and so it's really great that we've figured out that you've figured out perhaps a programmatic way to uh, adjust some of the biases we have with you know body shape and types colors of skins etc um right yeah, so I don't uh, work on kind of racial or other bias uh, specifically myself, um, but I know other people are working on that and they're using similar techniques as to what I described. Um, I have one um, line of work where we looked at gender bias in image captioning systems. Oh. Um, <laughs> and so there we basically wanted to know, you know, if so an image captioning system will um, take an image and generate a natural language caption to describe what is in the image. And one application is for people who are visually impaired, like, for example, using Twitter or social media, you know, they have screen readers that can tell them the text, read out the text, but if it's an image, um, oftentimes there's no way for them to know what's in the image. Um, or you know a video or something like that. So so image captioning has an application to this problem, but um, when, what we looked at is if the image captioning training data set is biased uh, in terms of gender, what happens? Like what hap How does the model then behave? It, does it also become biased? Um, yeah. And you know not surprisingly, it, it does. Um, for example, I think we found that, you know, the so the the images that the model is trained on come from Flickr and they have a bias towards uh, male words in the captions. So um, more male than female. And then the model, when it starts to caption on its own, it even exaggerates that bias even further. So the mm. proportion of times it uses it uses male words is even larger than in the. I'd data. love to spend an hour discussing with you what male words are. Red Hat is starting uh, a committee on gender neutral language, right? Um, that I'm dying to get involved in. I have a background in, in okay, German language and literature, but a lot of linguistics. Um, so it, it's fascinating what, what you just said. Um, but 
to apply more generally, I'm sure that, um, especially with spoken text, the whole idea of accents uh, would also mm -hmm. fold it, be, be something that has to be um, really accounted for. Uh, for. Yeah, and we actually, we were doing uh, sentiment analysis on uh, things like uh, conversations that we had recorded internally or um, uh, transcriptions from people in meetings. And when we first did that, we realized the corpus that we used to train the model was social media data. <laughs> and that's a whole a completely different language english language than than what people actually write and so um you know if if we had some of these techniques to catch that a little bit early on like hey wait a minute um the the data you train this on looks nothing like the data that you're feeding it and to 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 an outsider looking in it's it's all words right it, you know of course this would work um but uh, yeah that's one of the, one of the first experiences i had with with bias data and not even realizing it like hey we train this on Twitter data. That's actually not going to work <laughs> for the way people really speak. You know, we don't talk with emojis. <laughs> right, right, right. Nor do we talk with um, in newspaper print, right? There have been so many experiments that you take even the most educated, most um, fluent speaker and they still, if you transcribe exactly how they speak, there's still grammatical errors, fragmented mm. sentences, et cetera. So if you train on language that is meant for being read, you're in a completely different uh, arena if you're trying to apply yep. those rules to, to spoken language. But I realize there are other people in the chat. And so I just knew to click on, you know, ask permission to, to be part of the the vocal chat so please other people in the room yeah. um join us join join us i might actually get off so that um other people can take the space <laughs> under you yeah all. thank you yeah just click the uh, share audio and video and, and anyone who's interested can 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 join in here but thanks again thank yeah you. that's great yeah i think people join it will just keep tiling kind of like yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's that's uh, so i always wonder like um how do you know the decisions that you're making are biased because it's one thing if you're in an autonomous vehicle and that vehicle hits someone that's very obvious but we you know let's let's look at it from from red hat's perspective where we do um some machine learning on top of telemetry data that we've collected from infrastructure maybe those decisions that are being made are a lot less obvious that there's some bias because it's not as dramatic as hey i just killed someone it's you know maybe this machine maybe the algorithm just chose a little poorly, but I may not even be aware of it, or, or maybe even for something like fraud detection. Um, uh, it's not, it's not catastrophic if it makes the wrong decision for, uh, for scale scoring something that could possibly be fraud. So how, how is it? I guess what I'm asking is how can, what are there, what techniques are there to be able to understand that, Hey, I do have some bias and it is affecting my results. Right. Um, so I think that's a really good question. Um, as you mentioned, you know, when you have a really high stakes application, you know, like you, you can literally, you literally have a killer robot, uh, which is, which is a self-driving car is actually a killer robot, right? <laughs> Cause it's a robot that could kill you if it doesn't recognize that you're in front of it. Um, or you know things like fraud detection or surveillance, where you really care about having very high accuracy, um, then I think you tend to do a lot more testing, mm -hmm. uh, and you probably won't be satisfied with just kind of collecting one data set and testing it on that one data set and seeing how well you did and kind of walking, you know, okay, great, let's let's push this to production now. Um, 
So you're going to do a lot more testing and hopefully you're going to do testing in different kinds of environments, different situations. Um, but uh, sometimes it's less obvious, like when you, you were mentioning some kind of sensor data and it's not obvious that the data is mm -hmm. actually biased or, or not biased because as, to a human eye, like it's hard to interpret what the data even means, right? Um, yeah. Um, and in fact, even if the data is interpretable, sometimes there could be something in the collection process that uh, is introduced that we don't think should be a big deal, but the model will take advantage of it. So one example is um, there was a study of, I think it was x-ray images um, uh, detecting some kind of lung disease and um, the researchers trained it on a bunch of data that they collected in a hospital and tested it on data from the same hospital it worked really well then they uh, applied it in a different hospital and it completely broke mm -hmm. and it wasn't obvious you know why why did the performance drop so much in this just different hospital and it wasn't until they tried doing some kind of like you know explanation techniques to try to highlight what parts of the scans the model was really focusing on to predict the disease, they realized that um, in that hospital, for the sicker patients, they used uh, an x-ray machine that was, I think, portable, and then it had a specific metal token inserted in the image. And the model just learned that that token was a predictor, mm. was relying on it to predict the disease. So that's an example where you just, you may not realize that the model could kind of cheat um, by uh, using something else in your data that is not a problem for a human. But, um, but yeah, anyway, I think some of the techniques that could be used is maybe um, just machine learning techniques like measuring the entropy of your data or uh, measuring uh, kind of uh, the distribution distance between the training data and the target domain um, and just kind of trying to see basically automatically detect if your input data is out of sample you know something like outlier detection essentially great great and actually we have uh, Diane and William they've joined us uh, I will also say if anyone wants to continue to join the conversation Please, you can just share your audio and video, and it'll be like uh, the Brady Bunch. We'll just have, to have a bunch of people just popping up. <laughs> I, I I didn't realize. I thought it was like ask to share, and that I would be, <laughs> I would be brought in when when you were ready. But suddenly I'm here, and I'm like, oh, whoops. Um, there you go. So, so my my question then on this is: It sounds like the data scientists need to be kind of domain experts are almost like like you can't just hire a data scientist and go hey come on in here here's data it sounds like they have to be start getting much more aware of what that data means and start becoming an expert in that domain within the hospital or within uh, was one of the efforts Sherard and I are looking at is the manufacturing you know the factory floor and what's going on with the machinery in order to decide you know, I'm missing data. Like, it sounds like there's, when things break, it's because I'm missing data. There's some data I'm yep. missing here. And uh, where do I go looking for it? So is that part of this bias uh, work you're looking at? Does that make sense, what I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, uh, part of it is becoming more of an expert in the, in the application domain. So if it's, you know, if it's uh, data that's coming from the factory floor, um, maybe, you know, the first thing to do is even to like, uh, test your model in a different factory, you know, mm -hmm. like if you transfer your model from the factory you trained into a different factory, does the model still work? So I think a lot of it is just very rigorous testing. I think a lot of the time, even data scientists don't, um, go beyond just like that one uh, test data set that they took essentially from the same 
data collection process where they got the training data, right? So usually what you do is, okay, you collect some data, you label it, and then you randomly split that data into a training part and the test part. Um, but what that does is actually it takes your test data from the same distribution as your training data. So you're not going to see any domain bias there because it is the same distribution of data. Um, so those those kind that kind of testing isn't going to uncover this data set bias problem. Um, and you need to be at least uh, enough of an expert to realize, oh, there could be different situations where the model is applied. I mean, it's possible that you'll never like, for example, like if all I want to do is train a detector for this one cup in this room, maybe I could film it for, for a long time, you know, make sure I record all times of day, all lighting conditions, everything, everything I can think of. And I never, my model never leaves this room. Maybe it's fine. There's no domain shift, you know, but until like I put, you know, milk instead of coffee here and oh. I haven't seen that before, you know, so it's. Yeah, this is fascinating because it sounds like something like Sherard that on the manufacturing when you could instantly imagine yeah. that, hey, this machine learning example works great in Germany, but we open mm -hmm. a factory floor in Singapore and suddenly things are all different. It's like, why are they yeah, different? Yeah, the factory doesn't look the same, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah. It look, maybe it I... looks the same, but there's underlying pieces that are different. Maybe yeah. voltages yeah. are different or humidity is different or whatever it might be for the camera i'm wondering like in the factory settings how important the camera is right. mm -hmm. part of this yeah. you know i mean i have someone who's family member who's working on a problem like this in factories and uh the accuracy of the end product was not nearly as high as they expected and it was that question that i asked earlier where the model they're using was um, trained on single digits, very similar to the example you gave in one of your slides. And then uh, it is expected to, the model is, ex is expected in the factory to read multi-digits, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering what you think the best, you know, method is to go, like, is transfer learning the best way to deal with that? Like, start with your MNIST, like, you know, just understanding single digits. And then on top of that, add a new data set that has multi digits? Or is that just, you know, or like, is there, do you know how people are tackling that problem? Because I'm, it seems like it's got to be so common. Yeah. So um, I'm not a, you know, I'm not in industry, so I don't have any products, but I apply my work and my techniques to a lot of different academic data sets that I actually collect myself because there are very few multi-domain data sets out there. Like if, you know, for digit recognition, it's just, just MNIST and you train on MNIST and you test on MNIST and it all looks the same. Um, but like we, for example, have a very large scale data set we just collected um, of images of different objects, like 350 different categories of objects. Um, and we have six domains. This is all from the web. So we have um, uh, image like photo domain, we have uh, clip art domain, infograph, sketches, drawings. Uh, so each of those is we split this data set into these different domains and we test our models on like how well can they handle these shifts from if you train on the clip art domain then you test on the drawing domain can our domain adaptation method improve performance um and so i you know i think at the very least if you're developing a product you should at least um try to collect several domains of data from your problem and not just kind of you know get data and not worry about it you know um, and then see if you train on that one domain, like, let's say you have factories, you collect in one factory, you test on another, um, or you collect in the morning and then you test at, in the evening. Right. So, and, and then see if your performance drops and then if it does, then yeah, use the techniques that I talked about domain adaptation. I mean, you can always collect more data. That's always a solution, but it's expensive. Right. And like, and eventually you, you probably will never collect and label all like, you know, this dinosaur costume example, you'll never mm -hmm. collect all possible data that you'll ever see. So 
you do need to apply some of these techniques. So yeah. it seems okay. like cool. maybe if you're going multi-digit, that's what you want to recognize in the end. Maybe you should start with multi-digit from the beginning. That's true. I mean, it seems like that might but be But then what if all of a sudden, like, I don't think you have a lot of control over how your customers use your product in the real world. What if they point it at single digits? <laughs> and then they complain, oh, your method stopped working. Yeah, I mean, digits just seem so you know, the US Postal Service somehow figured out how to do this, recognizing, you know, people's handwriting on their letters and stuff. So it seems very solvable. It, in fact, initially, it seems like a really simple example. And then it turns out to be not so simple just to recognize digits that are printed by, you know, the same printer every time the same ink, you know, you think that would be very easy in a factory, but it turns out it's not that easy. Yeah. yeah, because there's all kinds of um, other conditions, like you said, you know, if if um, there are more more than one digit in the camera's view, then you're going to have clutter from those neighboring digits. Um, or if the lighting conditions are different, the camera sensor changing, the zoom level, uh, the blur. Yeah, it's it all. But yeah, like all, the humidity in the room and the camera, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of there are a lot of factors that can affect the image capturing pro process too. Yeah. So I, I like what you said before, Kate. In uh, you know testing out a model in different scenarios, like if you do have if you've developed your model with data that came from Germany, then throw it in a manufacturing plant that's in Mexico uh, to see how it performs before you go all in production with it. Um, unfortunately, you know, self-driving cars, you don't have that ability. Hey, let's just throw this model in this new vehicle and, and, and see how it performs. Uh, so I, I wonder if that's part of this as well as like developing best practices to combat bias and, um, you know, almost like a, you know, just a, a set, set, a set of standards that you have to, uh, of kind of abide by, or at least be willing to follow to be able to combat bias. Uh, yeah, I think a set of standards would be a very good idea. Um, you know, and then again, I think a lot of it should come down to testing. Um, so like one of the problems that um, researchers uncovered with face recognition, um, they could be, um, they, they, they could have come out just, just if the, the company selling those products had done more rigorous testing. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, as a company, you always, you don't want to admit that your product fails in some situation, but I think with AI, we have to be more upfront and say, look, you know, we can handle Germany, but we don't know how well we'll do in Ireland mm -hmm. or we can handle single digits, but anything else, multiple digits, daytime, nighttime transition, we can't guarantee anything. Um, and, and so like if, if the company is like, I think it was Amazon and IBM and a couple of different companies that were selling face recognition models that were, uh, biased, uh, in a, in such a way that they had higher, much higher errors on females and on dark skinned people, they might never have even thought to test like across these different demographics, um, you know, they just tested on the entire data set, which had some of those demographics represented in the data set, but it's hard to see it when it's like 10% of your data. Overall, your accuracy could still look very high. And, and you, mm. just can't, you can't tell that you're failing on certain, I mean, I think when it comes to people, at least we should have very rigorous standards. Hey, John. Hey, John. Good to see you join us. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, I was gonna uh, ask Kate a question. In, in uh, you know, really, really liked your presentation. I only caught a little bit of it, though, uh, for what I did see was uh, very interesting. Um, uh, I'm working actually with some energy folks, and um, you know, we've had biased discussions quite a bit on a couple different areas, and um, you know, some of it is computer vision based bias uh, as well, and um, uh, particularly with weather changes or the, the quality of the camera uh, has come up multiple times. Uh, particularly like a flare monitoring type of thing or algae monitoring thing. 
And um, what, one of the things we were actually looking at was some of the some of the stuff that Selden has in the Alibi project. And so I didn't know. If, do you have any opinions about you know how like how so the bias is something that's a, like an ongoing health of the model type of th way we've been talking about it. But like, is there any, do you think the Alibi tool can help solve that? Or is there other recommendations you might have uh, for how to keep that model healthy? Uh, so I'm not familiar with the Alibi tool. Okay. Is there something that you're using? Uh, and maybe you talked about it in your presentation. I apologize if I missed it, but just how, you, how you're doing that, that bias detection. Yeah, so I don't know, are you using deep learning? So we're, we're some of this is PyTorch or Pyro, right? And there's TF stuff. Um, TensorFlow? And there's, there's all kinds of different, they were, yeah, so TensorFlow, sorry. Okay, um, then that's deep learning. Yeah, so, you know, the, how the, you know, CNNs, GNNs, uh, a couple other different mechanisms where they're doing brute force on all of them and then picking the one that has the best R score um but like in continually trying to do that and then try to do that without backhauling everything um yeah, yeah so, so what i what i discussed is a couple of techniques that um are applicable to neural networks um mm -hmm. and so one thing i talked about um was adversarial feature alignment where you essentially add an, a discriminator to your model that tries to discriminate between source and target examples and you have to have the, the two domains at least for this yeah. um, but there's other methods that don't require you to have two domains and they just kind of um they're called domain generalization as opposed to domain adaptation and they try to uh, create synthetic examples um, to augment the data and kind of simulate other types of domains but if you have multiple domains you can use this domain discriminator approach where um you train it with an adversarial loss so you maximize the accuracy of the domain discriminator and then you alternate by um updating the cnn backbone itself to minimize the accuracy of the domain discriminator um so there you know there there uh, there's a lot of research code for this i don't know if there's anything like you know more production grade out there mm -hmm. but as far as research code i mean my students have a lot of code probably in TensorFlow and PyTorch. Those are yep. the most common deep learning frameworks. Um, and, you know, so the, the, yeah, there are a lot of papers that come out in machine learning conferences and computer vision conferences. Like every conference there's, you know, a couple dozen papers on this. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I've been reading on it for a couple months, but it, it's like, a, it's, it's one of those uh, rabbit holes right where you start reading and you start <laughs> you, well you i've been reading. doing this for 10 years so yeah, yeah, yeah. so maybe you down more of the line of business <laughs> yeah there's yeah there's maybe you've been down all those rabbit holes already so there's a lot yeah so, okay well, thanks, cool. we thanks, probably sir. have time for we probably have time for one more question here anyone else want to ask kate anything something in the chat but I, I'm not sure if there are any questions per se no I don't think any questions um, uh, I've been responding to them there uh, I, I'm so I've got a personal question for you Kate uh, what made you get interested in this in... why was this an area that you felt uh, in computer vision in general oh computer vision in general I see um, so when I was uh, a graduate student, I actually started out working on speech, uh, speech recognition. Um, I, was a, I was a grad student at MIT working in um, Jim Glass's group. And um, at the time, it seemed like speech recognition, and this was uh, in 2002, 2004 frame, time frame, seemed like it was actually starting to work. You know, now we take these things for granted. You just talk to it and, you know, my, my, my kids and my family members always make fun of the Google Home when it doesn't recognize something. And I'm like, oh, my God, it recognized what I said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember the time when that didn't work. Um, but, you know, the time it started to work actually fairly well to the point of becoming a product. And I just thought, you know, I think 
it's a little bit too much of a solved problem for me and I would like to attack something much more uh, difficult, uh, open problem. So I switched to computer vision, uh, which didn't work at all at that time. <laughs> like we did not have CNNs. We did not, I mean, we had CNNs, but like they didn't work yet. So, so were you in applied math or what, what department were you in when you were doing that at I MIT? ECS. Uh, it was in the CSAIL lab, the CSNAI lab. At, uh, uh, my my son's girlfriend is at MIT right now in getting her PhD, <laughs> doing okay. robotic stuff. So I just that's a good part of good there. place for that. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think you're lucky you avoided the RFID mess that came out of MIT. So, <laughs> so, so I don't know. Not, over, yeah, not sure. There yeah, was, I was there for a while though. Yep. Yeah. This is a lot more interesting than the uh, the tag business. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, great. I think we're out of time here. Uh, this has been awesome. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. Uh, Kate, thank you so much for the very interesting topic. I could go another half hour here. Uh, you know, very cool stuff. No, it's really fun. Yeah, thanks for hosting the, the discussion, George. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.